Diego Lugano, un ex jugador profesional de fútbol de Uruguay, es conocido. Professional soccer player from Uruguay is known for being one of the most talented athletes in the sport. His professional career lasted for more than a decade, from 2003 to 2014, which allowed him to play in 95 matches and two World Cups. In May 2006, Diego became the captain of the national Uruguayan soccer team, and he did it for eight years. In the 2010 World Cup, Diego was named the best captain from among all the participants. Very well. Welcome, Diego. Welcome, Diego Lugano. We know that he is the sports director of Sao Paulo, former captain of the Uruguayan national team, a major soccer personality in Latin America and worldwide. Diego, how are you doing? Welcome, and thank you so very much for being with us. Well, good afternoon, and, and thank you for this invitation to talk a little bit about everything, right, about life. It, it, it's a pleasure to be talking to all of you and with all the people from all around the world that will be listening to us, right? That's right. You have a great message, and that's why we are so excited to have you here, Diego. A great message of, well, following one's dreams, the dreams of becoming and of following your passion for soccer. And, well, we know that you've traveled all over the world. And that's what we're going to talk about. This is a conversation between friends. And, Diego, we're going to talk, like you said, about life, about your journey, your family, and your experiences. So, really, first of all, thank you very much. It's an honor for me to spend a few minutes with you. And, Diego, how about we dive right in and talk directly about your journey, about how Diego began to feel this passion for soccer, right? We know you're from a nation, a, a country with a strong, strong passion for soccer. S since you are from Uruguay, which was the first country to ever host the World Cup. I suppose that as a child growing up, you saw many soccer personalities, right? What role did soccer play in your childhood? And Diego, when did you realize that that was what you wanted to do with your life? Well, like you said, in all Latin America, soccer, and especially in Uruguay, plays a culture and social role that's much more important than simply being a sport. It really defines our country. It really defines who we are, you know. There's hardly a kid in Uruguay who isn't born wanting to play soccer and wanting to play on the national team. It's something that is deeply rooted in our culture. And I was just another one of the thousands and thousands of kids who dreamed of being a player. And I was motivated toward that from a very early age. And well, that's where the cycle begins, right? And it's like, like a filter, like a road that, that you travel, but obviously, Uh, along that road, there's a lot of effort, a lot of repetition, a lot of, com of competition, just the way it has to be. And well, I was very fortunate, mainly because in my city, in Candelones, which is in the countryside of Uruguay, and because of my parents and also my friends, always encouraged me to press forward, you know? And how important it is to have that support, correct, when you're pursuing a dream. Diego, you told us that, of course, in a country like Uruguay, and I'm telling you this because I'm from Spain, and I know that soccer is next to religion, you know. Kids in Spain are almost born with a ball on their foot, right? Diego, what are some of the personalities that somehow, during your childhood, had an impact and establish a, encourage you to establish a career as a professional soccer player? What personalities of Uruguayan soccer, and not just Uruguayan soccer, but also international soccer, what personalities had an impact on the type of player that you became? Look, I love history. I, I really do. And soccer has a very unique history in Uruguay. Right. Uruguay is a country that became independent in 1930 from two powers, which back then were Argentina and Brazil, or Spain and Portugal. And for many years, decades, it was a small country between two giants. We were looking for an identity. It is written in the history books. It's not that I'm making it up. And we were called the East Bank of the Uruguay River, or in other words, the east side of Argentina. 
And in 1900, when we began competing in soccer at the South American level, beating Argentina, beating Brazil, uh, beating the Europeans, that was when we began to feel Uruguayan. Soccer gave us a sense of belonging like a national identity. So I rely a lot of that on that philosophy of the visionaries of that day. In other words, in my country, soccer is about so much more than kicking a ball around. It's something that defi defines a country, something that defines us that is just not taught. Through soccer is how some very powerful messages are sent. It's a very important vehicle for conveying some powerful messages. And back in those days, there were already players, there were politicians, and people who, who envisioned this as something very important for our country. So as a good historian that I am, I identified myself a lot with the vision of those captains, like Andrade, like Fernandez, Obdulio Varela. I didn't get to know them only through history books, but I know that's where I come from. I know that's part of my origins. I know they are part of my roots, and then you try to follow that historical lineage, you know? That's right. And if you had to tell me, well, look, one of the greatest players that impacted me the most and that influenced me the most, who, who would you choose? Someone I saw playing? Yes. As, that I saw playing as Uruguay and maybe Hugo de Leon internationally. Well, I'm from the days of Zico in Brazil, Socrates. And well, in Europe, the Dutch players Van Basten and Gullit, but that I did not see play, but that I read about a lot and that I know I come from, Abdulio Varela, who was a great captain for Uruguay in the 50s, and he did a lot of things. Well, he was a soccer world champion, but mainly, he used that strength, that popularity, to excel on the field and to do great things on the social level and to improve a lot of situations in soccer and in the Uruguayan society. And we know that's something that has influenced you as well, because we'll talk about that at the end of the interview. You're very committed to social causes. And we're also trying, you're also trying to do your little share to change society through your name, uh, utilizing your fame and your influence, so to speak, correct? Exactly. But Diego, now let's talk a little bit about the lessons you've learned from soccer in your life. We know that soccer, like any sport, is a discipline that requires a lot of focus, um, also a lot of effort, and very, very much being consistent. What would you say have been the greatest lessons that you've learned from soccer in your life and that maybe you've been able to apply in your personal life and perhaps even in your family life? First of all, I would say it's resilience, you know? Resilience because unless you're a Messi or a Cristiano Ronaldo or you're a, a phenomenon when you're a teenager or a young man when you are just starting out, a lot of more doors are shut than opened. You get told no a lot more times than you get told yes. So what does this mean? That coaches don't consider you, uh, there's clubs that don't want you, and, well, again, doors that are not open to you. And I think that happened to most of those of us who reached a certain uh, pro level. And that's where you have that resilience of saying, no, I'm going to insist. I'm going to insist. I can do it. That's my dream. And I think that's the first uh, great lesson and the most important thing, both in soccer and in life. That's a very important point. I'm sure that a lot of people who are watching us are saying, well, that's happened to me too. And instead of saying, like you said, I got to keep going, I can do it. What message would you give to those people that found the door shut, who've thrown in the towel? Diego, how would you manage to keep going and pushing at that door? I think it's part of life, you know. If all the doors open just like that, then there would be no point no. for it. There would be no point in pursuing one's dreams. I think that one of the things that keeps us alive and that define us as humans is to always take on the challenge, to go beyond. The satisfaction lies in breaking your own limits, your own boundaries, not in achieving great results, whether they're in a sport or business or economical, but in continuing to move on 
from your own little faces, and that's what fills you in the inside. And ultimately, what you feel, those emotions, that's the only trophy that you take with you. All the medals and the photos are just memories. But the feelings, the feelings of pride, of resilience, of being successful, those are the things that make us happy and make us feel satisfied. And as for me, for example, what makes me proud of the career that I had, and when I look back, is that I always have a peace of mind, a, a peace of conscience, my inner peace that makes me uh, which I try to, to to teach the youth, you know? And that's uh, the reward that lies in that lifestyle. And what you just said is so important. Looking back and feeling proud of the journey that you've already traveled, which probably in your case, Diego, we know that many youths are looking up to you and they, they look up to you like you used to look up to these soccer personalities from back in the day, right? So we've talked about the lessons you've learned from soccer, the first one being persevering, pressing forward, and not giving up. Any other lesson you've learned from soccer and that you've also applied to your personal life? Well, soccer is a team sport. Everything... Teamwork, uh-huh. Everything, everything, everything you do, it reflects on the team, and everything the team does reflects on you. So that gives you a feeling of a group vision, solidarity, and everyone understanding their role within a team, understanding it, absorbing it from who are the leaders and followers uh, to the most introverts and extroverts, to the one who takes the penalty kick and the keeper, then who's the best speaking to the press and who's the more reserved one. Soccer begins to instill in you that concept of a team, you know? If your body is okay, then you're okay. And if your exactly. body is not okay, then you have to push him to get better because then you depend on him and he depends on you. Could you say that soccer is like a family? Have you felt that way on the teams that you've played for? And we're you're going to talk. We're going to talk about that. You've ha you've made a great international journey. Do you consider your team a family? Uh, uh, well, in soccer and uh, the players, it's so important. They are your family because every conquer, every dream is with them. You spend time with them. You compete with them. You suffer, are happy. You hug. You cry. So it becomes a world where you learn some very important values, you know, knowing how to lose, how to feel frustrated when you're on the bench, respecting the one that is playing, waiting for your chance, competing with lealdade, I, I mean, uh, loyalty. I, I, I was speaking Portuguese. And competing in a way that also motivates and helps your teammates grow. And well, respecting the senior players, the ones with experience. And then when you're the old guy, you can pass on a message to the rookie. You've always got to know those roles. In other words, it's a family. And soccer is really a summary of what the whole society is, you know? And soccer, unlike m many other sports, happens to be special in a way that it covers all the social levels all religions, all, all, all races, you know, all cultures. And soccer, in that sense, is one of the most democratic things there's in the world, right? I always give the example, for example, in countries such as ours in Latin America, the soccer locker room must be one of the few environments where everyone comes together, from the son of the country's president to a humble boy from the slums with a complicated life story, from someone from the Jewish, Islamic, or Catholic religions. They all, they all coexist in harmony with a common objective. In this sense, soccer is fantastic, and I don't think there's another sport or other activity that can put all, all of that together in one simple team, all in one simple locker room. I 100% agree. And proof of that is the way you see World Cups take place, you know? I haven't seen moments in world history in general when we've been that united as countries and as fans. And yes, of course, soccer is something that brings together cultural 
cultures, religions, genders, and everything else. But yes, how, f how fortunate you are, Diego, to have been able to experience all of these things that you've been able to see up close at so many World Cups. And then we also know that as captain of the Uruguayan national soccer team, you have an incredible essential role. Tell me a little bit about, like you were saying previously, soccer, your team, one great family. You've sort of been the patriarch of that great family, right? Which is your country's national team. As a leader, what traits do you think are crucial for a team in order for, uh, for them to have, in order to have that connection you were talking about? where everyone is connected and you have this sense of family. What traits would you say a leader needs to have and that you've developed as a captain over the years? I think the main thing is that you really got to be coherent. That you have to practice what you preach. That has to be consistent. You cannot... Uh, exactly, preach what you don't practice. That is the first big and powerful message that you have to give your teammates, uh, your co-workers, right? That's how you gain respect, you gain credibility, which is the most important thing. And after that, it's obviously empathy, understanding the different personalities, you know? Each player, each teammate, each person have their own way to react. And they have uh, their personalities. They want to hear the same things, maybe said differently. This day-to-day -day empathy, this understanding that makes people respect you, that also m makes you understand your group in a better way so you can better benefit from it when it's needed the most. That is something that I... that could be repeated in any business at any level of our society. Wonderful. Thank you very much. All right, let's move on. And we're going to keep talking about your journey, Diego. Thanks to your professional career, you've basically traveled the world from, from north to south, from east to west. Tell us a little bit about those opportunities that you've had to travel, thanks to soccer, of immersing yourself in cultures that are so different from yours. Tell me a little bit about the different countries you've had an opportunity to visit and live in and the lessons you've learned from being amongst other cultures. That is the greatest and most wonderful thing that soccer has given me because I enjoy of it and I take advantage of it. Our, uh, look, my first major experience was leaving my hometown, Canelones, which is in the countryside of Uruguay with a population of 20,000, and I actually lived still in the rural area. In other words, my family are country folks, and I came to play in Sao Paulo, which is the fourth largest metropolis with 25, 40 million people, crazy traffic, and obviously such a huge and impersonal city. I was 20 years old and I was already married to Karina, my wife. Back then we had a newborn baby, Nico. He was just a few months old and we moved here to the city, which is like a monster and I'm, I'm still here to this day. That was the greatest change that, that soccer allowed me to learn everything from another point of view. Sao Paulo is a city that multiplies everything by a thousand because of how big it is. And I came from the countryside of Uruguay, from the smallest country in Latin America, from Uruguay. It was a great change. And then later, another incredible change that I had, it, that I took advantage of, it was when I went to Istanbul in Turkey, where I lived for five years. On a side note, I can tell you, Karina was seven months pregnant here in Sao Paulo. Seven months. We had everything figured out. Uh, we were going to have our second child here in Brazil. We were all settled. And then right out of the blue, I get this opportunity. And well, I looked into it, and that's how soccer is. You just take a decision, and boom. Quick ones. And uh, Turkey, Istanbul, another language and culture. And I told Karina, we're leaving tomorrow. Uh, she said, what? <laughs> Heck no, we're not leaving with seven months uh, pregnancy. And what about language and culture, my child? And no, we're leaving. Everything's going to be just all right. And well, we were received in such an incredible uh, warm welcome. 
We had our second son, Tiago, who was just here, and Bianca, our daughter and third child in Istanbul. And those five years that I lived in Istanbul were awesome. It's a culture where I learned to view everything that I had been taught from another perspective, the same thing from another perspective. And I have a million stories about that, and it taught me a great respect for their culture. Obviously, I also managed to become well-liked because of how I played and because I made an effort to understand and comprehend how they view many things. I had two children there, and we were really happy with my family living over there. We assimilated into the culture in a remarkable way. I don't speak the language. I am terrible for languages, but my family speaks it well, especially my children, and well. It was a magnificent experience. After Istanbul, I went to Paris for two years. And what a city. So much history, so much glamour, so much culture. And that was awesome, too. Awesome. And that's how I also went to Spain, England, a year and a half in England. Just wonderful. I spent six months in Sweden which was this idea that I had in my head. I wanted to see the Scandinavian countries, and I took advantage of soccer, you know. By then I was 33, and I was the one who decided where I wanted to go. No one chose for me. At 33 years old, you've done all this. Well, uh, that happens in soccer. At that time in your career, you decide where you want to go. No one does it for you. And so I wanted to see the Scandinavian countries, Northern Europe, that culture, and soccer was the excuse. I'm going to play over there, I said. And those were also some very wonderful months, uh, up to the point where I came back to South America and brought all those experiences with me, and also mainly my family, too. We had that experience of having lived in those countries that are enriches you as a person. That's wonderful, and I completely agree with you. I think there is nothing that enriches a person's life more than seeing the world, getting out, and being able to immerse yourself in these other cultures. And I really love what you've said, Diego, because you didn't just go there to live in a place. You got there to learn. You learned the language, even though you said you're not very good at languages. It doesn't matter. I tried, tried. I tried honestly. That's right, you tried. Immersing yourself in the culture, trying the food, understanding other people's perspectives, right? I suppose, and we're gonna talk about your family a little later on, that you've also seen how this has enriched the lives of your children, correct? Now, before the interview, you told me that some of your children speak up to four languages, or three or four? Yes. That's amazing. Yes. Everything their dad cannot do. Everything their father couldn't do. That makes it easier. Now, just out of curiosity, tell me about the foods that you've liked the most from these countries. I'm from Spain, so be very careful. You'd better say that you love the food in Spain. But no, tell me, out of all of these countries that you visited, what are some of the favorite foods that you liked? Uh, uh, look, after I left Uruguay, well, th this is the thing. Spain has a Mediterranean cuisine which has a lot of common with Turkey cuisine. Uh, Turkish cuisine is spectacular, Mediterranean cuisine, an enormous variety of fresh fish and vegetable that is just impressive. But well, all things considered, since I'm Uruguayan, I am a carnivorous by nature, right? So we love meat here in Uruguay. And the kebab, the doner, the beklebab, uh, the Turkish beklebab is just awesome. But there's a great variety of vegetables, salad, fish, Any different of yogurts. You eat very well there. And France also, well, we have, um, we are more familiar with the French uh, cuisine, you know, everything to do with, with France. And Diego, now speaking about being in all of these countries, what, what characteristics did you find that soccer fans have in common, whether it be in Spain or Paris, England or Turkey? What was it like to be around these fans who were all united by the same sport, you know, soccer, but from such different places around the world? 
Well, to tell you something, uh, look, in Turkey there is a passion for soccer that is just crazy. That's, and I had a hard time to understand that because they don't have the soccer level or the international recognition or the titles that Spain or Italy, Argentina, uh, Uruguay and Brazil have. So it would be easier to understand that there would be some greater passion for soccer in those countries. I had trouble understanding it, but obviously experience taught me that, well, people don't follow a team because of the sport. They follow the team because of the social need to have a sense of belonging to something. And you see that all over the world. And um, as a sport, Soccer helps thousands of people to have their religion in that team, which they can identify with so that people can think like them and rejoice and suffer together. I think that's a need we have as humans, right? And like I've said, soccer really summarizes our society. It's a perfect uh, summary of our society. And again, those are things that transcend sport. People don't just go to watch a game. They go to feel part of something and that's what repeats itself all over the world that's wonderful really thank you so very much and you're definitely right so let's keep talking about your travels throughout all of the world and your journey we know that you didn't travel and move from country to country it wasn't something you did by yourself it's something you did with your family you mentioned that you have your wife how long have you been married Diego 20 years. There you go. 20 years. What a success. 20 years and 23, almost 24 since we dated first. Wow. An entire lifetime. It's a whole lifetime. A companion for life and eternity. She's from my hometown, from Canelones. Oh, she's from, from the there countryside too. of Uruguay. Her too. Now, Diego, let's talk about Karina a little bit. Not how has she influenced your career? What does it mean to you to have someone by your side who understands what it is to be your in your profession, your passion, and your what your career is all about? We're not talking a nine-to-five job at the office in the same city for 30 years. This is a job that has taken you from north to south and east to west. How important has your wife, your wife's support been in your career? Well, let's start with this. We've known each other since she was 14 and I was 15 in my hometown, Canelones. In other words, uh, since before I ever dreamed of being a soccer player, well, it was a, a dream, but I would wake up to, to not deceive myself, right? So we started uh, uh, living together long before this dream ever became reality. Obviously, that, that influence, when you're younger, uh, you have a sweetheart, you have um, someone to strive for, um, someone, just someone to dream about your future with, you know, uh, someone to think uh, about that, it gives you responsibility, it gives you strength, and it gives you that resilience that we were talking about. Uh, that's before you become a player later, when you become a soccer player, then another phase starts, you know, the phase of going on adventures together, of leaving Canelones for Sao Paulo from rural Uruguay to the fourth largest city in the world. By then, we already had a child, a, a little one. We were all on our own without speaking the language. And that's where that series of adventures began. And she's been an incredible companion because you know that players often spend the weekend concentrating or traveling. I had a good fortune of being there for the birth of my three children, but it was luck. Most players don't get to do that. And well, she has always been by my side. She has also had to leave her parents, her sisters, nephews, nieces, and sometimes has to spend Christmas or holidays abroad. She's been an incredible companion. And I think that's a small part of my children's, or actually not just a small part, but a major part of my children's education is, is thanks to her, right? And as humans, we are creatures of habit, right? 
we get so accustomed to this life of a new adrenaline, new adventure, starting over from scratch again, that nowadays it's almost hard for us to settle in one place. We returned to Sao Paulo three or four years ago, and we are already looking to see where we're going to go next. So the support of Karina has been a marvelous resource and something that you've needed throughout your entire career. Really, I congratulate her. She has my respect. Because as a mother, it's it's probably very difficult to move from country to country and other cultures, all to be with your companions and chase his dream and his journey and passion. Now, tell me about your children. For them as well, how has it been for them to accompany you in your adventures in, in your career? I suppose that... Since they were little, they didn't realize it as much, but then they had to change schools, they had to change friends, and constant change. What have been some of the most difficult or challenging moments for you, so to speak, as a family? What have you faced together in this journey? Uh, well, my oldest son, Nicolas, has been the one who has had the the good or, or maybe ill fortune of experiencing my whole career uh, being a little more aware. Because at the age of five or six, he started being, uh, to have a memory of it all. And Nico now plays soccer and also goes to school. He's the one who has been with me uh, just closer all the time and was able to feel what it's like to be a professional in this sport, which is so popular and so awesome. And like everything else, it has a good side that comes from having that cultural exposure, from having lived in different countries, speaking different languages, and from having friends all over the world and understanding any culture, any person. Of, of course, it's, it's clear that um, you don't have a permanent residence that that makes you kind of lose that sense of belonging or or being rooted in, in some place in particular. That's a problem. However, since we were always together as a family, we always had a very solid and, and strong family core. And that kind of made up for the fact that it's not easy for any teenager to change schools, change friends, start all over again from scratch. It's not easy, but well. That's where our family core became even more important. Yes, yes, this unites families more, right? To have to have all of these opportunities. Now, speaking of your family, Diego, I know that, well, as you already know, you've been invited this exceptional year uh, to the virtual conference for Roots Second Family Search. I know that thanks to Family Search, you've discovered, we're talking a little bit about your roots, that you have Italian roots, correct? Yes, Italian. Now, tell me a little bit about how understanding your roots and your ancestors or knowing stories about your grandparents or your parents has helped you. Tell me how it helps you in your everyday life and um, how it's helped you learn about who you are. Yes. Uh, well, my family, my grandparents, and actually my great Grandparents were great, great. Well, I don't remember. They came from northern Italy, which is the area of uh, Piemonte, Alessandria, which is an area with vineyards, wineries, and a lot of agriculture, and a good place for a family. And in other words, all the cultural things that the Italians have always given to the world. And it's more or less what I am, right? Even though I live now in this metropolis of Sao Paulo, which is a crazy place, I escape to the countryside every time I can. My aunts, my uncles, and parents in Uruguay still live in the countryside. They have their farms, their plantations on the 25th of December. Well, that's that's a sacred time for Christmas, Sundays, and Sunday dinners are sacred. Those are things that probably come from that Italian culture, their rituals, family rituals, you know, that sometimes you carry out without even knowing why. But then you realize that you come from these uh, genes uh, where things have always been done that way. And then it helps you understand and feel proud to want to pass these things on to your children because you can never deny your roots. Quite the contrary, right? You've got to seek out your roots to become a better person and, well, to continue developing as a human.
That's right. What are some of the traditions that you would like your children to carry on as they form their own families years down the road? What are some of the traditions that are closest to your heart and that you would really like to remain within the Lugano family many years from now? Look, later on, I'll send you a picture of our family. Every year on December 25th, uh, during Christmas, the, the whole Lugano family gets together. And they're actually, oh, those are actually the origins of my uh, grandmother. She has seven children. One of them, my father, he was the youngest. He's the youngest. And well, my aunt with her husband had children and grandchildren, each of whom had their spouses, their partners. There are more than 100 of us from 9 a.m. on the 25th until 12 at night, that is a sacred time. Everyone is there. To those of us in a family who are abroad working or studying in different parts of the world, the 25th is sacred. But Diego, where do you put 100 people? Where do you huh? gather all of these people? No, no, it's not a house. It's a countryside. Oh, so you're out in the open. It's in the countryside. Well, in your way, in December 25th, it's summer, right? Remember, we are in the southern hemisphere. Of course, it's summer. Oh, so you're out in the open. It, well, exactly. Then all those Italian tables are filled with fruits, with food. So my aunts, there peeling their the fruit home, uh, home style for the fruit salad. My uncles barbecuing in the fire pits. Um, you've got the family homemade wine. The kids uh, just playing around. The old folks uh, playing a game. It's just awesome. Those are the origins of my family. It's a tradition that even I started doing when I was a boy without realizing. And now, in fact, I see that it's a tradition that goes back more than 100 years. So you've got to know how to have a good time, you know? That is so, so important to share these cultural heritage and traditions with your future generations. And I really love that. Maybe one of these years you'll invite me, Diego, and I'll go on the 25th. That'll be great. So now you can count on 101. We'll be there. I'll bring my family, too. But no, Diego, speaking about this very thing, and with that, I would like to finish this pleasant conversation we've had. You leave behind an unquestionable and undeniable legacy with regard to the world of soccer as captain of your team and having achieved such great success within your country and the teams that you've played with, a very important professional legacy. Now, tell me a little bit about the type of your a personal legacy that you would like to leave behind, not just for your family, but also for the coming generations that may have been following your career. What type of legacy would you like them to remember also, aside from your professional legacy in within the wonderful world of sports? I think the most important thing in this complicated world that we live in is that um, either in soccer or in any area of life, you can realize your dreams and your hopes for the future. And that's through hard work and dedication, but mainly by being honest and loyal. There is no need to step on anyone's toes, no need to do evil to achieve your goals. It's just in the contrary. I think the more decent, the better of a friend you are, and the more, uh, the better you do things, the more doors uh, open and the universe conspires and opens up. So being a good person is the main thing in any area of life. That doesn't mean you can be competitive. All of us are competitive. We all want to win and conquer in any area. But that doesn't mean that you need to have any ill wishes toward anyone or to do weird things. It's about working, being honest, looking straight ahead, helping the person who is next to you or in front of you because tomorrow the tables may turn. And that creates a kind of, of energy that turns into positive things for, for yourself, right? I always think that, well, that's why I always wanted and still want to be involved with soccer. Uh, uh, at least here where I have some media space because you get that from soccer being com competitive and having big dreams doesn't mean you have to do bad things or to be disloyal it's just the opposite the more proper you are and the more human the better of a friend and the greater empathy you have the more the universe opens up in your favor I love that message that's such a great truth such a great truth I love it Diego thank you for sharing that now 
you've told us that you're living in Sao Paulo. You're very involved with your soccer career there, but you're also very involved in social causes. And I know that there's one area in particular that's very close to your heart. That's defending minors, defending children. Tell us why you're so involved in this in order to change some of those injustices involving children. Well, I am proud to say that my teammates and myself on the Uruguayan national team, uh, we have a foundation that involves all the members of a team uh, from Luis Ares, Edison Cavani, Diego Godin, Diego Forlan, and our entire generation. We share a foundation in Uruguay that's called actually Fundación Celeste, a Blue Sky Foundation. It's a nickname for our national team. And in, uh, in our opinion, we are so visible, so many uh, adolescents and kids listen to you that and you need to take on that challenge. You have to assume that responsibility. It would be easier not to, but you've had to do it. We have commi commitments. We have the responsibility to make our society a better place. And throughout that fun foundation, we have a lot of programs for teenagers and children, always sports-based, in order to promote um, good social coexistence, good habits, education. And I always say that our great advantage uh, is it's exactly that giving a message or a physical object to a child is important. But when a player from the national team in your country in Latin America relays that message to a child, that can really be life-changing for them. And that responsibility is one that we all have taken on. Everybody is on their own world, but we always have to find the time to participate physically in a project, not only to send a picture of a, or a message, and giving away little pieces of encouragement, little messages that are always important, you know? That's wonderful. And truly, like you said, being in the public eye is a great opportunity, but also a great responsibility. And knowing how to use that platform and this voice that you have, Diego, is so important. And I can tell that you are completely committed to the youth, to the children. And to conclude, what would that message be? I would like for you to imagine that you've got uh, all of these young people who are watching you right now, young people with dreams. We know that right now the world is going through some truly challenging situations. What would be, what advice would you give this new generation? In one way or another, they're trying to forge their way ahead and maybe feeling a little bit discouraged, you know, because of the different circumstances that they're going through in society and in our communities. What advice would Diego Lugano give to these young people, this new generation? Well, my father used to tell me that he didn't give me advice. He gave me his opinion, his opinion. And so I, um, well, very often I don't consider myself all that important or wise to be giving advice to the youth. But I do give opinions about what I've experienced and what I see and, and about my children. I think that adolescence uh, is a unique and wonderful part of life, and you have to live it to the fullest day by day, always, always looking toward the future, always planning to do good things. But the most important thing is here and now, and you've got to live it to the fullest with joy, with love, uh, with friends around you. I think. I think that's a great present that we all have, right? The gift that we all have, the reward is the journey itself that leads to the goals that we have. And I think the most important one is today. Uh, enjoy every day and hopefully you'll have a lot of obstacles to figure out because that's what life is all about. That's how you challenge yourself and improve and then you feel more satisfied. Excellent. And with this message, we will finish. Diego, it has truly been a pleasure and honor to spend this little while with you. I wish we had all the time in the world because you really have a very positive and optimistic uh, outlook on life. I really like what you said, that hopefully we will have a lot of challenges. I don't think everyone views challenges that way, right? It, like, bring them on, keep them coming. Claro. But we know, and I understand, like you said, that it's thanks to these challenges that you grow, that you develop and improve as a person, right? So 
Diego, you truly have an exceptional and wonderful message. Thank you so very much for being a part of Roots Tech. Thank you for continuing your work among society and the youth. And you were saying now that you don't know what's next, right? Well, maybe you should come here to the United States. What do you think? We'll be here waiting for you. Well, that's what I ha what I have See? left to do. See, I, I need to you. do it. Yeah, definitely. I have to do that still. Perfect. Well, wherever. Don't give ideas to my wife because it's going to happen. No, no, no. This is between you and I. Well, because we might find a challenge over there. You're right. Well, many blessings for you and your family, for your children, and thank you very much for uh, holding this interview. Until next time. Thank you for the invitation, Family Search, and all the people who are listening. It's been a pleasure to share my humble experience of life with all of you. Ciao.